Welcome to the NIH OITE Community College Day panel, preparing for your four-year university college experience. I'm Dr. Pat Cole, and I will serve as one of the session co-moderators, along with Dr. Kristen Zukowski, who will monitor the questions. Just a few reminders, please use the Q&A box to submit questions for the panelists. We appreciate your use of respectful language when submitting questions. Important information from the organizers will be communicated through the chat box. The sessions are being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Our focus today will be on preparing for the four-year college university experience, transfer, scholarship, and success. I am so delighted and thankful to have three outstanding professionals who will serve as our presenters today. Dr. Marquise Casey, Dean of Instruction, Utica Campus, Hines Community College in Jackson, Mississippi. Mr. Omar Harrod, the Lead Recruitment Specialist at the University of the District of Columbia, that is, which is located in Washington, D.C. And Ms. Karina Reed. Assistant Director of Transfer Admissions, Office of Undergraduate Admissions and Recruitment, Enrollment Management at the University of Maryland, College Park. They each now will share a brief introduction. Dr. Kissy. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful informational uh, to continue your path in as sec successful a way as possible. Um, I'm honored to be here to give you my little uh, expertise. I've been a dean for 15 years at a community college in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I am serving at another location in Utica, Mississippi, which has given me even more experience uh, at the two-year level. Um, I did before that, I served at a four-year institution where I did have uh, occurrence to uh, mentor some of our transfer students who had come from community college. So I, I am grateful for the opportunity to share. Um, as we begin talking about the experience, again, I'm coming from the experience as a dean and an instructor of mathematics. So I hope to offer you, and please feel free to ask questions as I go through. Um, so that we can, you know, stay on one accord and, and give you that direction that you seek. The first thing that I would like to address, uh, if, if I may, is what is articulation? And Dr. Cole, as a speech pathologist and specialist in speech, I know that, you know, that probably rang out to you. <laughs> but in, in this sense, articulation means coarse articulation. And what we, what we mean when we say that in higher ed, um, we're looking at the objective base for your courses at the community college and making a comparison and equating them with the course objectives at the four-year institution. So when a course does articulate, that means that you can take that course at a community college and the four-year institution will honor that course as having been completed. Now, the, the joy in this is that some states are working on automatic articulation agreements. So we are seamlessly transferring all of our community course credits to that four-year institution. And this happens mostly on the public side. Your private institutions will have private articulations. You may have heard of two plus two agreements. And so we'll, we'll explore some of those in our conversation as well. But we want to make sure as we begin to transfer that we understand articulation of our courses so that we don't have to retake all of that same information when we make it to the four year institution. Why is this so important? Like, because again, you're looking at time to completion of your two year degree, time to completion of your four year degree and the financial availability of your resources to support retaking so many of those courses. If you look at transferring to a four-year college or university, there are some options that I have listed. Your Associate of Arts degree is, is the general degree. The two-year program will re re result in that degree. The Associate of Applied Science degree is for our career and technical students who now also have opportunities to seek a four-year degree. 
sometimes you may not make it to the entire completion point, but you have completed your core requirements, which is about a 32 to 34 hour process. All of our associate's degrees are gonna give you about a 62 year, 62 hour pursuit. And then when you get to the four year college, you want to have completed half of that by the time you make it to that distinction. So now you can transfer to some public institutions and private after just taking a few courses, but you really wanna make sure you get those core requirements if possible. And again, that's your English, your math, uh, your history, your fine arts, and some of those courses. Our next steps as you're kind of going through that process, I would like to see just a, a strategic process um, in these four steps. Make sure you contact an advisor at your receiving institution and have your transcript evaluated. You want to make sure that everything articulates and that you are on the right path if you've chosen a program of study. Now, of course, we're at college, we're, we're, we're fresh, so sometimes we've chosen a program and sometimes we haven't. But if you can, finalize that program of study so that you can complete those first two years according to that plan for the transfer institution. Again, you still have to apply for admission. Some colleges will allow you a seamless admission, but for the most part, in, time, in timely fashion, go ahead and apply for admission before um, you, you know, exit your second year of, of the community college. And of course, update your FAFSA and apply for those scholarships. Stay away from student loans, okay? So that would be my uh, information, my intro for you. Thank you. Good afternoon, let's see. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Omar Herod. I am the lead recruitment specialist at the University of the District of Columbia. Um, just to kind of give a brief description of who I am. Um, I received my Bachelor of Arts degree uh, in Mass Media Public Relations from Hampton University in 2002. Uh, started working for the university in January of 2015. Um, and I've been in uh, the admissions world now for, I need to update it now, it's been 17 years. Um, and, um, and I am a product of the, the University of the District of Columbia. Uh, my mom is a, an alum uh, of the university, but she also went to the predecessor schools, um, DC Teachers, Federal City, Washington Tech, and also um, um, completed at UDC. Um, and my passion is just getting, uh, helping others to get to not only achieving their dreams um, from the academic perspective, but even beyond that. Um, the next slide. Um, just for the requirements, uh, mission requirements for the university. So we have several different um, entry points for the university, um, including our workforce development uh, uh, certificate programs, which are free for DC residents. Um, and there are a variety of different areas that you can choose from um, from that. Um, then, or you can apply for associate's degree programs at our community college location. Um, as long as you have a uh, high school diploma or a GED, um, you're admissible to those programs at the associate level. And then for bachelor's degree programs, um, you must have at least a 2.5 or better GPA. Um, under normal circumstances, we, it would be an 890 on the SAT or a 16 on the ACT. But due to COVID-19, uh, we've uh, sort of uh, modified our requirements. So as long as you have at least a 2.5 GPA, um, you can be admitted to a bachelor's degree program. If you have a 3.0 or better GPA, you do qualify for a scholarship. Um, and that's at either the associate or bachelor's degree programs. Um, for associate's degree programs, SAT or ACTs are not required regardless. Um, and currently we are using AccuPlacer for our placement uh, purposes for students at the associate level. Next slide. Submitting documents. First, you have to apply. That's how we know that you're interested. Uh, so if you go to our website, go to udc.edu, um, click on the apply button, um, then you can uh, fill out the application. Um, we are waiving the application fees and, and normally we would do it for um, DCPS and DCPCS stu uh, students. However, uh, due to COVID-19, we are waiving fees for everyone. So all cohorts, all areas, uh, we are waiving the application fee. Um, so that is a wonderful thing. So uh, 
uh, go ahead and apply as soon as possible. Um, our next uh, available semester will be the uh, fall semester, which will start either August or September, but we do have summer sessions that will start in May. Uh, we would need your official final high school transcript or official high school transcript. It uh, must be signed by a school official and for the final transcript it must have the date of completion or graduation date on it. Um, again, SAT or ACT scores are optional. If you took it, great, go ahead and submit them. If not, no worries. Um, and then also if you're coming in as a transfer student, uh, we would need your official college transcript. Um, so we would need both your official final high school transcript and your college transcript. And then if you're 26 or younger, we'll need your immunization records. If you're over 26, we, you will not need to submit those. Next slide. Um, submitting your documents, you just need to submit them to UDC trans scores um, at udc.edu. Residency, that's, a, that's pretty big for us. Uh, we have three different tuition rates, DC resident, metro, and non-resident. So if you are a DC resident, you would need to submit your uh, you um, have a couple of options in that regard, DC, your DCID or um, uh, driver's license, uh, voter profile if you're registered to vote in the area, certified state tax return um, or state benefit transcript, or if you're a DC government employee, we will use your hire letter. Uh, we would need two things from that list and they need to show you've had it for 90 days or more. Um, and that will go to residency at udc.edu. Um, our uh, address, physical address, we're at the University of the District of Columbia, Office of Recruitment and Admissions, 4200 Connecticut Avenue Northwest, Building 39, Level A. We have a virtual tour, so feel free to go on our virtual tour. Uh, we would love for you to come and check us out once we fully reopen, uh, but for now you can do it virtually. So uh, um, definitely check out our virtual tour. Next slide. Just a couple of our popular majors at the associate level. We have liberal studies, computer science, technology, law enforcement, which is a um, great uh, opportunity um, for if you're interested in going into law enforcement. We actually have a program with um, the uh, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Police Department. Um, and it is a, um, it basically we, the individuals have an opportunity to do that program. There's a stipend for that program. Um, and so it is a guaranteed job. So that is a, a really uh, phenomenal program that we offer at the associate level. Business administration. Um, it fits, feeds into our business management program at the bachelor's level and in education from workforce all the way to our graduate level, we have education. That is one of the things that we are known for. That is what we call our bread and butter. Um, at the bachelor's degree, uh, we do offer biology and other areas uh, in sciences. Uh, we do offer computer science, um, psychology. Uh, we also do have, offer social work business management and architecture. And I will also say that we are um, recent, we were recently named the number one most affordable mechanical engineering program in the country. So that is really, really cool. Um, so if you're interested in going into engineering, um, we are definitely the place to come and do it. And you won't be uh, spending a whole lot of money doing it. Um, next slide. Some of our unique majors that we offer at the university, uh, we do offer our aviation maintenance program. We actually have a hangar at Reagan National Airport. Uh, however, due to COVID-19 right now, they are not um, taking students in for that program. So once uh, restrictions are adjusted, then they will be able to um, uh, go back into that program. Uh, fashion merchandising, we do offer um, at the associate level, graphic design, mortuary science, that is a, a phenomenal program. Um, that is a guaranteed job. Once you complete your associate's degree and, and receive your uh, certification um, for that program, you can start working. Um, and then we just uh, recently brought back our associate of nursing program, uh, which will feed into our RN to BSN program at the bachelor's level. Um, at the bachelor's level, we do offer administration of justice. So if you're interested in criminal justice, biomedical engineering, um, digital media, if you're wanting to either be in front of the camera or behind the camera, um, that would be the program for you. And the nutrition and dietetics um, is a phenomenal program. If you're interested in working for yourself, possibly, uh, we are a land grant school. We're the only urban land grant school in the country. So you have the opportunity to um, engage. Uh, we have rooftop gardens. We have a farm out in Maryland. So you would be able to not only figure out what things work for our bodies, but um, how to prepare them if you're um, looking to maybe even be a chef um, or work with food preparation. And then again, our RN to BSN, uh, BSN nursing program. Next slide. 
these are the wonderful uh, women that you would be working with. They have been, I'm the only male in the office. So, um, so um, these are the uh, women that you would be working with. Um, they are your admission counselors. Uh, we are broken into cohorts. So we have first time in college and that is uh, students that are coming directly out of high school or if you've graduated from high school but never started uh, college anywhere else, you'll be considered a first time in college uh, applicant. Transfer, if you're um, transferring from another institution, readmit if you attended you, the university before and want to come back. Um, second degree, if you have a bachelor's degree already but want to do another degree, you can do that. And then non-degree, there's opportunities if you want to just take classes for credit, you can do that. Um, and so you would be considered a non-degree uh, applicant. Or if you're interested in applying for graduate school, then you will be applying as a, a part of the graduate cohort. Next slide. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to go. Um, you can ask them in the chat uh, area and uh, my information is uh, also in the chat as well. Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay great. Go ahead, Karina. <laughs> uh, Zoom space. Uh, so my name is Karina Reed. I'm the Assistant Director for Transfer Admissions for University of Maryland College Park. I know sometimes it can be a little bit confusing because there are multiple institutions within the state that have the words University of Maryland as part of their title. Um, if it helps at all, we are the ones with the turtle mascot. So we are the Terps, we are the ones uh, that you might see our basketball team or our football team playing. We're also a research university, which means any program on campus, whether it be biology, art history, American studies, they're all completing research of some kind all the way through from undergraduate work that you can work on with professors to graduate work to professional that the professional professors that are actually teaching you are doing their own research work. So there's a lot of opportunity to engage. Now, the reason my first slide is uh, my coalition slide is because we just recently came on board with the common app for freshman applications, but the, right now that is freshman only. So anyone that is thinking of applying as a transfer student, it's really important that you go to the coalition application and you complete it through there. You can still also apply through the coalition as a freshman applicant, but you can also use the common app. Uh, that may change in the future, but we would let people know way, way ahead of time before you had to apply um, if there was gonna be changing uh, in terms of application platforms. Now, with transfers, because that is going to be a good chunk of what I'm going to talk about, there are some things students use on the coalition that everyone uses, and there are some things that we wish more students would use because it's helpful to them, and it's a really great resource we want them to take advantage of. So one thing all transfer students use with the coalition application is obviously the application itself. That is the only transfer application that we have. You absolutely must use that application to apply to the University of Maryland College Park. The two other things that you see up on this slide, the collaboration space and the virtual locker, these are things I wish more students would take advantage of because they're a really great resource. What it basically is, is a space for you to work and plan out your application before you actually start the application. That way it takes you less time. You already know what your essay is going to be. You've already worked out things like resume if you're choosing to submit a resume or activities list and you can just go put the information directly into your application and not spend so much time completing the application. I know, um, the admission application is pretty lengthy, especially since it comes in two parts. It's important that people know there's a profile section and then there is an actual University of Maryland College Park section. The profile section applies to all students and all institutions on the coalition. So when you complete that profile, it'll go into any school application that you select in addition to the University of Maryland if you're applying to other coalition schools. The actual University of Maryland part is pretty short because it takes all the information that you put in the profile, puts it in the application, and then you just have a few things left to do. Um, and it doesn't take that long to do the second half, but I know a lot of times students are not quite sure if they're on the right application because the profile doesn't say anything about the University of Maryland, specifically because it's for multiple institutions. 
So I just want to make sure people know what to expect when they log on to the application. Um, and also that there are resources to help you plan out your application to make it a little less stressful. One benefit to the virtual locker is the collaboration space where you can invite people to look at things like your essay drafts and they can help you proofread it, create one you are really, really happy with, and then you can add it to your application later on. The people that you invite to the collaboration space should really be those that are in your life and are helping you with the application process. This wouldn't be a good spot for admissions professionals from the University of Maryland to be in. We get your application on the other side, but we absolutely can answer any questions you have about the application process. Um, I know that's a lot of talking just about an application format itself, so I'm gonna go to the next slide, which is what's actually in the application and what our timelines are, what we're looking for. So the application itself uh, has a $75 fee. We do have fee waivers. It's based off whether or not you qualify for a universal fee waiver through the coalition account. There are some uh, things like you've been on free and reduced lunch, uh, any college board waivers that you've had in the past. If you are a veteran or a current service member, then you also qualify for a fee waiver. But we also know that for transfer students especially, there's just times when there's not really a good fit for those universal categories, you kind of have an individual need, that category doesn't really help out in terms of you requesting the fee waiver, you can request it individually. All you would need to do is write to apply Maryland at umd.edu and just literally write transfer fee waiver request. As long as you put the reason why you're making the request, we will look through them individually and get back to you. Now, one important thing to keep in mind when you're requesting a fee waiver is because we have to review them individually, we need you to give us a little bit of time in order to do that. So if you're thinking of applying on the last day to apply before the deadline at midnight, we very likely are not going to get to your email before you submit that application. So just make sure you're giving us a little bit of time to really look through your request and give you the appropriate response. Same thing with any questions that you submit to that Apply Maryland email, they should all go to that email. The most helpful thing is how you address the subject line. So basically, if you have a question on transcripts, it should be transfer application, transcript question. That way we know how to route it to get the fastest best answer for you and you can move forward with what you're trying to do for your application. That email is also a great place just if you have general questions. Sometimes there's not something really specific. You're trying to figure out something like timeline, um, prereqs, limited enrollment programs, all wonderful questions to address to our admissions email and we are happy to answer all of them. Uh, again, as long as you give us at least a couple days before whatever it is is due so that we can give you enough time to do what you need to do. Now, in addition to the application fee and the actual application form, which has the essay within it, you are also going to need to submit official transcripts for every institution that you've ever attended. That means even if you could, took courses in high school for dual enrollment or middle college or early college, or you just took summer courses because you wanted to take the course, we still need official transcripts from all of those institutions. When we review applications, we review them holistically. So we're not just looking at what is your straight GPA, or we're not looking for a magic number of particular science courses or English courses or math courses. It's how those parts all play together. But what is important that we, is that we have your full academic record. So send all of your official transcripts so that your application can be considered complete. Optional, you can submit letters of recommendation or uh, activity list or resume, it's up to you. I would say if it comes down to a timeline issue where you're worried about making a deadline versus getting an optional document, it's always better to make the deadline with the required materials and have your application be late for something that would be optional. Students that choose to submit resumes or letters of recommendation are usually students that have something exceedingly uh, unique or special or different. They've worked with Congress people, they have had multiple jobs, they have been very engaged in a particular field. That often helps with the application review. Academically, we're looking for about a B average or above, so that's around a 3.0 or above cumulative GPA with completion of your fundamental math and fundamental English, so that would be equivalent to freshman English and freshman math. 
the other courses you take up to you as long as they are mostly academic in nature and you are consistently successful in them. In your essay, we just want to see why you would like to come to Maryland. If you have a specific goal, that's awesome. Tell us about it. If you don't and you're figuring it out, absolutely fine. We have many students enter undecided. Um, what we really want to do is just get a chance to know you beyond kind of the transcripts and the numbers and the essay helps us do that. Deadlines, March 1st for fall and August 1st for spring are our early action deadlines. We encourage students very, very strongly to use those deadlines because you have best chance of admission. We haven't admitted anyone yet. We don't have space issues. We also can review for scholarships for those deadlines. There is a final deadline of November 15th for spring and a final deadline of June 1st for fall, but you lose out on scholarship opportunities. So the next eligible term would be fall 2021. For spring 2021 and fall 2021, if you have less than 30 credits, you are no longer required to submit standardized test scores. That is due to COVID at this time. We have not officially changed our policy on standardized test scores beyond that point, but if we do, it will certainly be up in plenty of time. If you have less than 30 credits complete after high school graduation, um, 30 college credits, then you would need to submit high school transcripts. Uh, that is a lot of information, I know. Yeah. Um, most of it is available on our website. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we're going to move in our, into our Q&A. Uh, I'm going to start by opening a couple of questions up to the panelists before we move into our Q&A box. My first question, which I call action steps. What two actions can students take to improve their four-year college options and transfer academically successfully, as well as to transfer financially successfully. You want to start with the academic one, Dr. Casey? Sure, sure. Um, and I guess I, I'm on my soapbox again. The, the most important thing I believe is, you know, after you've taken 60 plus hours at the community college level, you want all of that information to count uh, when you transfer. And so I definitely emphasize that your, your receiving institution you need to make a contact and there are people in place at your home community college who will help you. Uh, we make partnerships. I've made phone calls all over the nation, just making a contact so that I can get transcripts evaluated. Um, just, you know, as an example for the biology classes, if you know that you really don't want to major in STEM or science, there's a different biology for you. Uh, if you're going into liberal arts or some other topic. So you want to make sure that your courses, all of your courses are going to count towards that major. Um, naturally, your freshman English, your freshman math, your gateway courses, all of that will be standardized. But as you get into those business administration electives, you want to make sure that entrepreneurship at the community college will transfer as entrepreneurship at the four-year institution. So those type things, I think that to me is one of the most critical steps. Getting that, trans that transcript in someone's hands that can talk you through which classes of yours, you know, are, are going to make the list and which ones maybe, you know, kind of borderline or which ones don't don't qualify. Um, you know, we have a personal community health class in the state of Mississippi uh, that I've been working on. It's named the same thing at all of our institutions, but we all have different objectives. So you want to make sure that your classes, everything that you're doing, all that hard work, you've sat through A&P um, for, for four, four semesters, you know, you've taken one and two, the lectures and the labs, you want it to count uh, and, and represent. Um, the second action I would say would be to make sure you're making a, a good, good standing at the community college level with your faculty members. Make those contacts lasting so that you can have those recommendations that are needed when you transfer to the four-year institution. Um, it's always good if you're, once you've transferred, if you have questions and you're, you're unsure about a path, it's good to have someone at your home location that you know that you've spent two years with, someone that you can call, you can reach out with an email uh, and make that contact. I confer with students all the time who 
who have graduated from our college, um, but they have my email. They even have my cell number. But if they just have a quick question, they can just text me real quick and I can shoot them back, you know, okay, well, you need to go to admissions and you need to see, you know, someone in the admissions office, or you need to go to the registrar, or you need to go, you know, to one of those offices. So always make a contact and get that transcript evaluated as soon as possible. Those would be my first two action steps. <laughs> okay, Karina. Okay, uh, so all really good actually took a lot of words out of my mouth. I think most of us really want students not to lose time, not to lose money, to know how to go about getting the information they need because there's a lot of offices. So trying to figure out which one can be difficult. Um, I'm gonna echo, hold on to your contacts and then just add that you should also think about building those same contacts at your four-year institution. A lot of what you're doing while you're in undergrad, yes, it's helping with your courses, but it's also helping with things like internships, research, graduate programs, job opportunities. So continue to build that contact list, continue to build those resource building skills. I think that is something a lot of students struggle with, how to go about creating this resource kind of section that they have that they can refer back to. And then hopefully you can share that with others that are coming up behind you and we are helping each other get through. Really, the only other big thing I wish students would do is uh, ask questions uh, before something actually happens. Uh, it is much easier to solve a problem before it's a problem when it's just a question. Once it becomes a big challenge and a deadline has passed or something is, you know, you're not able to withdraw from this anymore, that's much more difficult. So please don't be afraid to ask questions. We all work in higher ed for a reason. We want to help you take advantage of it. Okay, Mr. Hara. Um, and pretty much echoing everything that has already been said, but one thing I will mention that I've noticed, um, a lot of times students don't realize that when they stop school, it doesn't stop their grades. Um, so they need to make sure like if you're not, you know, for whatever reason you need to leave school, make sure that you actually do a total withdrawal from the school. Um, because if you stop going to class doesn't mean that you still don't get a grade. <laughs> um, and so we, we tend to see students that said, oh, you know, I attended, you know, whatever school and I stopped going for whatever reason. And we're like, okay, well, we need a transcript. And then when we get the transcript, they are um, in academic issues with that particular school, which will prevent them from um, transferring um, to the university. And so, you know, the, make sure that if you, for whatever reason, feel like you cannot complete a semester, it would, it's better to find out what you need to do to withdraw so that you, it, it doesn't count against you. Um, and so that, that will probably be outside of what was already said, that would be the next biggest thing because um, it not only does it affect the grade piece of you of your <laughs> academic life, but also will affect your financial aspect of you as well in terms of financial aid. Um, so that is that's a, a really big thing. Um, outside of that, um, our school is probably a re really unique because we have associate's degree and bachelor's degree. So um, if a student starts out an associate's degree, all they're doing for us is literally changing their major from their associate's degree to a bachelor's degree. Um, so it's a pretty much a seamless process in that regard. So. Um, but if you're transferring in, regardless of for associate or bachelor's degree, um, same thing, we'd need all of your um, your documents. Um, we would need your SAT or ACT scores, but we would need your official final high school transcript and all the um, official transcripts from the schools that you've attended. Um, and that's pretty much it um, for us. Um, so we're a public school, so that, that's the other unique thing too for us. Speaking of financially transferring successfully, what are some actions you think they should take as far as their financial needs when they make that transfer? Um, definitely find out what each, each school is looking at, um, what their um, different, uh, you know, financial aid packaging and, and their requirements or rather what, you know, what, again, we're a public school versus a private school, um, that's gonna matter. Um, so where you live, for us, your your residency, that's going to determine your tuition rate versus a private school where it doesn't matter where you live. Um, so things of that nature, you want to find out <clears throat> uh, what scholarships or, or grant opportunities are available to you. Um, so again, which is why, again, if you leave your previous school not in good standing, that could affect your financial aid. Um, so again, you want to make sure that you are in good academic and financial standing with your previous school before transferring. Um, 
So that would be my biggest thing. And there are also, there are scholarships um, out there for transfer students. Um, not as many as new for new students, but there are some out there. So finding out what that is. And a lot of times I always suggest talking to your department. So it is good to con make contact with your departments because they will be able to kind of let you know, hey, um, you know, if you're interested in, you know, biology, there is a, you know, scholarship for you know whatever something in that area so um, if you get an opportunity to connect with the department they may be able to you know assist you in that regard as well okay thank you my next question to the panelists uh is rel relative to do's and don'ts uh, what hinders students in the application process and the second part of the question is what pit what pitfalls should students avoid Dr. McKees, you want to start? Sure, sure. <laughs> I'd love to. Um, okay, well, I guess just from my perspective, what hinders students with the application is just uh, maybe procrastination. We, we look at that application, okay, well, my deadline is two months off, and then we kind of put it to the side. We wait to get the letters of recommendation that we need. We wait to finalize that balance so that they release my transcript in time to make the deadline. Uh, as Ms. Reed was saying, Dr. Reed, um, we, we just, just in looking at compiling the application, I know that I've, I've sat with students, you know, we want it to be as professional as possible. So take the time to type it, you know, the, you know, handwriting the application, I'm not sure, you know, why that even enters our minds. A lot of apps are fillable, we can make them fillable, you know, but there's a way to make it as professionally and as presentable as possible. Um, when you start looking at, um, at, at your, uh, echo what uh, Mr. Harat was saying about finishing what you started. One thing I've noticed um, dealing with the financial aspect, um, a lot of students aren't aware that you do have to complete two thirds of the classes you begin each semester. And so I'm always on students, you know, if you're taking 12 hours, you need to finish nine of those hours. You need to finish a certain number in order for your money to roll forward the next semester. Um, if you fall to probation, you know, don't, don't panic. You still have one more semester to get back to good standing or to fall to suspension. And so the don't, I, I would say from my perspective, is just don't give up on that semester. You know, finish what you started as best you're able. And the best example is this spring when we were, you know, progressing as well as we were. Uh, and then after spring break, you know, there was no more school. Everything went remote. So a lot of our students who hadn't made those contacts with their teachers, you know, built the relationships and made those connections before spring break, were then scrambling after the break to try to make a contact and, hey, you know, I, I wasn't as attentive as I should have been. Um, start from the beginning with that plan in mind, um, especially now we have technology that will, will help us over the hurdle um, and, and talk to people. And I believe if, if we, follow the timelines um, as these transfer institutions are dictating and pace ourselves through it, um, I think it'll be a better experience. That's the worst you know, possible scenario is to get there to the night before and you see and Ms. Reed an email and she's unable to see it because she's looking at the deadline. Okay, well, I'm working with those students as priority who got it in, you know, two or three weeks ahead of time. And I'm sure she's going to do her very best even to, to, to get that message the night before the deadline, as we all do. But, but, you know, relieve that pressure on yourself. So I know that's a lot, but, you know, I could speak on this all day, every day, Dr. Cole, you know, <laughs> we could talk about this all day. Um, Especially for our STEM students, you know, this is the National Institutes of Health, yeah. our allied yeah. health students, you know, in terms of making sure to definitely. reinforce that to them. Definitely, definitely. And then if you are in a specialty area, we do have a STEM program on our campus. Those students actually have a specific advisor kind of giving them those checkpoints. So they, they have that advantage. Um, if you're in a STEM program, if you're in, um, we have a dance program, we have other special categories, we have athletics programs, then take advantage of that person who is assigned to give you that mentoring. Um, and ask those questions, you know, if you're not sure. Uh, and then share that information because there are other students, I'm sure if you have the question, someone else has that question as well. But make a contact, finish what you started, 
And, um, and I think someone mentioned, um, don't take too many loans. Don't take out any loans if you can help it. Apply for those internships and scholarships. Um, but keep your GPA whole so that when you are ready to look at those opportunities, then you will qualify and they'll look at you and, and want what you have to offer. Okay, any other points related to those do's and don'ts, especially for our STEM allied health and those prospective researchers we have on our, our set in our session today before we move to the Q&A box? I always like to say, um, don't copy and paste um, your world, your life. Um, a lot of times we, we, we look at one school or, and what their requirements are and all of those things. And then we go to another school and we think, oh, well, this school, <laughs> for some reason, we think this school is going to be like this other school and it's not. Um, so we, we get to be a, a little selfish. Each school gets, gets to be a little selfish at times. And so um, there are certain things that we want um, and another school may or may not want. Um, and so thus know what your school is, you know, the schools that you're interested in, make sure you know what it is that they're looking for and what they're, you know, what they want or what they need um, from you. Um, because each school is very different. Um, and even from the application process all the way through the, the admissions process in general um, is know what it is that they're looking for. Um, because um, a lot of times, um, and, and even, and it just depends on the school and, and the requirements, but even from the essay portion, um, I know when I worked at Hampton in the, in the admissions office, uh, it was so funny to get uh, letters of, or more so letters of recommendation, but definitely essays that said, oh, I'm so excited to um, apply to Howard University. And we're like, yeah, not quite the school um, <laughs> that you are applying to. So uh, you may want to make sure you're doing all your checks and balances on those kind of things. So um, just be aware again of that sort of that copy and paste um, aspect of, of things that you know exactly specifically what it is that the school is looking for. And if you're, you know, we understand that, you know, people are you know, using the same letters and essays and things of that nature for several different schools, but make sure you edit um, to make sure that it's going to the right school in the right place and the right person. Because um, it, it can be a little embarrassing. We, we laugh about it. We're not going to like deny you, um, but it is kind of funny, in, at least internally for that matter. Yeah, I would echo that. I think a lot of what I say to many, many students is what's your timeline? Um, what is your academic timeline? And a lot of times it's in regards to when should I transfer? Because a lot of times they are asking me a question that I really should be asking them. Based off your academic plans and your academic timeline, what semester makes the most sense for you to transfer? When you ask us, when should I transfer? We don't know because it's based off what you're doing and when you're ready, especially if you are interested in a particular field like uh, something related to biological sciences for College Park. We have specific gateway course requirements. It's a limited enrollment program for us. The timeline may be different than if you're interested in letters and sciences, our undecided program. And if you want to enter directly into the major versus coming in and trying a couple things out and wanting to kind of navigate. So a lot of times I think um, it's just about thinking of this as a process. A lot of times students think about admissions as that one time they applied and then they either got in or they did not get in. For us, really admissions is a process that you take one step at a time, building the appropriate record, building the appropriate application, knowing that this is also going to keep coming up as you go forward for research opportunities or grad school and what you do previously affects what you're going to be eligible to do in the future. That's not to say if anyone has a misstep or they choose the wrong thing or they just weren't ready for classes and they didn't do as well as they wanted to do that they are locked out of something that they wanted in the future, but it could be an additional challenge and you need to work around how to get through that. What do you have to take to make up for this to raise your GPA or when I'm writing my essay, I should probably mention that I'm aware this one semester looks a little funny because the reader is definitely going to notice. And if they know that you're aware of it and it won't happen again, we feel much more comfortable offering you admission versus I'm ready, it's perfect. And then you look at the transcript and you're like, is this the right essay for the right student? Because I'm seeing something they're not addressing. A lot yeah. of what we're doing in the admissions process is not just about are you competitive for admission. Um, it's 
are you ready to transfer? Is, is this in your best interest? Are you on a pathway that this is going to make sense for you? Are we adding benefit to your life? And if you aren't answering those questions, then it's difficult for us to offer admission. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to move into our Q&A box. So Kristen, I see that we have a few questions. So you want to start, Kristen? Yeah, so well, one of the things I'm wondering about um, that's not really in the Q&A box yet, but there are lots of things in here um, that we'll get to. Um, but we've talked a lot about the transfer process. I'm wondering if you all can talk a little bit about students that are already in the process of transferring or getting ready to start, if you have some, have some advice for being successful. You know, community college can be very different from going to um, a four-year university. So can you give a little bit of advice for students as they're thinking about how to be successful once they do transfer? Dr. Kissy? Sure. The, um, I think the main thing to know is that, you know, you have two years of college under your belt. You've been to college for two years to get one credential. So you actually are uh, more advanced than, than half the population at the college. You are a junior coming into this situation. Um, so have a confidence with that and, and use that to, to, to move through those doors where, you know, you've, you've gotten a foundation. And that's one thing that I really appreciate about the community college is that when you leave, you have a foundation and you can build on that um, but you've chosen this new institution that hopefully will, you know, reflect some of those ideals that you learned. Um, make those connections and contacts and confidence and get involved. Um, be the one that can, can lead the way for those students who may or may not be as sure. Um, remembering how when you first started at the community college, because those colleges are traditionally a little smaller, um, you, you were given um, that, that push to, to get ahead and you've had two years of that. Now it's time to spread your wings and, and go forth. So you can be that confident one to lead the others. Get involved would be my best advice. Um, I love to see when students, you know, they, they email me back with photos and they show me how they're, you know, they're uh, on the SGA um, and they came through our college, you know, they may have been the president, the treasurer, the secretary and everything else on campus they po possibly could be. Uh, and then they continue that. I think that's the confidence that, you know, you, you have to carry with you um, and you've got people supporting you all the way. We have. We have about 10, a little less than 10 minutes before our session ends. So Kristen, another question from the Q&A box? Sure, so a couple of questions about international students, um, scholarships that are available and ways to validate foreign diplomas um, for our international students. I know for the University of the District of Columbia, um, we use uh, NACES, which is NACES.org. Um, and I'll put that in the chat. That's um, they have a, a list of uh, of companies that are um, that are qualified to do transcript evaluations. Um, we are looking for um, for high school. They have to be document by document, and for college, it needs to be course by course evaluations. Um, so those are what we're looking for uh, for any of the companies that um, uh, transcript evaluations for international students. Um, as it relates to scholarships, um, it just varies. Um, we are the university is actually um, redesigning or redeveloping our scholarships um, for all of our students. Um, so they may be also looking into um, some scholarships uh, as it relates to the international piece. But that's where the again the department also is really good for that because. Um, they would be able to kind of give that student, depending on what it is that they're looking for, um, information about that and what those uh, requirements are as well as to if they are open to all students or just for domestic students or, you know, what have you. So um, it really just kind of depends on, on each situation in that regard. Great. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions about the FAFSA and changes due to COVID. So perhaps the EFC contribution that is listed on the FAFSA might not be relevant anymore due to layoffs um, and other things like that. Is there a way to um, to change that and what should students do in that situation if that is the case? So if 
does anyone mind? I'll start. Um, it, a lot of this is individual to school. You really need to reach out to individual schools to find out the appropriate ways to go about reaching out. Um, everyone is aware COVID has drastically changed everybody's lives. Um, some people's lives more drastically than others and all in different ways. Really, for most schools, you need to reach out to the financial aid office to find out what the process is for. I wouldn't, for instance, be able to give any information beyond what College Park does, which doesn't answer your questions for any other institution. Also, as a prospective student, some of what you're getting in terms of information is going to be couched as if you're offered admission, this is going to be the process that's available. There's not always going to be a hard, fast resolution that you can do prior to admission because that's when most schools actually get the FAFSA information for you. A lot of times we don't have your information until a student is admitted. But this is a kind of part of what I think uh, all of us has been saying, which is please ask questions, please reach out, don't wait until it's become a huge issue or you're looking at a deadline. You don't know what's available. Also, that can change time to time. We had the CARES Act come through with additional funding through the summer. You don't know that what is true right now will necessarily be true then, so please don't be afraid to reach out again if you've already reached out about something. A lot of schools do have a process of there has been a change of circumstance of some kind, some type of emergency review. Now that doesn't guarantee 100% funding, but it does mean you can be reviewed. Super, thank you very much. Um, what about for a student who's been denied as a transfer student for a particular program? Is it possible at your schools to get admission feedback? Yes, you can reach out to the admissions office. We're happy to answer questions. Um, it is a holistic review. So if you're asking like why student A got admitted and student B didn't, we can't do that. First of all, privacy. Um, but if you're asking how to make your application more competitive in the future, absolutely can do that. If we have anything that was a particular challenge, we can talk with you about it. The important thing is with transfer students, they're generally over 18. They need to reach out to us directly, not their parents or anyone else. When someone else re reaches out about someone else's private information when they're over 18, it's a bit of a challenge. So just make sure you reach out directly about it. Um, for our school, um, we pretty much admit most students, um, the only time that you would be denied admission to our university is if you have uh, previous issues with your previous institution. So if you were academically dismissed, um, we will, we can permit, we can admit you if you were on probation, um, but it, you are just, um, you can only be admitted to an associate's degree program. Um, and it, it still is on a case by case basis because it kind of depends on what it is for. But, um, but if you've been academically dismissed, we cannot, re, uh, we cannot admit you into the university um, until you satisfy the requirements for um, that particular institution. I will also mention that for the University of the District of Columbia, a lot of times people do apply to us as if we are a community college and we're not. We are a four-year institution that has a community college location. Um, and so uh, we, are, we are abiding by the, uh, a full institution, university institution um, uh, guidelines. So for us, um, you know, you must be admissible to the university itself. to add, Dr. Well, I was just going to uh, just echo that as a community college, we are actually open admissions. So as long as you are, you know, calling, working with a counselor, our admissions team will, will make sure that we clear those hurdles, everything except for the academic suspension. Um, at that time, we would have to work with your uh, original institution if you were trying to transfer to us in that status. Um, I do want to add that most colleges are working remotely in a lot of our key offices, uh, but don't give up on the process because you go to a campus and maybe there's a sign on the door. Make the contact. There are a lot of virtual advising sessions that are taking place through Zoom, similar to this session. Um, I, I know that they would be more than willing uh, to talk with you, to set up an appointment, um, and to work you through those financial aid questions, um, those advisement issues, or any of those things. Um, just, just make that step. 
if you go to a campus or go to the website and a lot of them have those notices where you can apply for a virtual advisement session um, to follow through on that process. Super, thank you. Um, do any of your universities have flex path programs? So classes that you can actually go at your own pace? Um, yes, we have actually uh, an entire uh, almost a consortium in the state of Mississippi um, called the Mississippi Community College uh, Consortium. So all 15 of our community colleges offer classes through this mechanism and they're completely asynchronous. You can, you know, once you've signed into the classes, you have 16 weeks, eight weeks, and you have first four weeks, second four weeks, third four weeks, fourth four weeks. You can start at any point and then you pace yourself from that starting point to that end point. Um, and that again is the state of Mississippi as a whole, all of our community colleges. Our public institutions on the four year level do the same thing, um, but it is a different uh, consortium of colleges, but yes, um, in, in that capacity. Maryland or UDC? No, no, okay. Super. Um, so we have about five minutes left. I know this hour has gone really, really quickly. Um, so final thoughts from our panelists, final pieces of advice as students are transferring and then um, figuring out how to really be successful um, at a four-year university. Okay, I just feel like I'm talking. But especially those students who are interested in, in, in our research, allied health, STEM career path, especially those students. Uh, my last piece of advice, I guess, would be um, if, if you are looking um, as a community college transfer and STEM is your area. And again, most of us, you know, we're, we're pushing those sciences. Uh, we're pushing that you get involved in an internship or some type of uh, hands-on guided learning throughout your, your experience. I think um, that is gonna make you more marketable. It's also going to build that confidence that I was speaking of previously uh, for you to be able to, to finish what you started. Um, if you started at the community college level, then go ahead and continue that on. Hopefully you can have that pathway. Um, or if, if you're unable to actually, you know, get involved in a STEM um, engineering or hands-on based program in the community college level, possibly once you do transfer, that could be one of the things that you put on your application that you are interested in doing summer internships or programs so that you can have that guided learning. Our career tech programs do that all the time. They actually have seat time where the students have to go in and they put in a certain number of contact hours. Um, and we're working on that for our academic students as well. But I think that would be part, you know, a part of our program where, where you have to seek that, especially in STEM. Programs like NIH, NSF, uh, the National Science Foundation, um, and NIH is National Institutes of Health. As we start looking at those programs, start doing the research yourself so that you can get on that research track. Um, LSMAP is a program that I've worked with, and that's the Lewis Stokes Alliance in Mississippi. Um, and what we've done, and it's a national alliance, but Mississippi does have our chapter, and that follows you all the way through the doctoral programs, your studies on the doctorate level. So you can get money at the community college level, they give you scholarships through your bachelor's and through your master's and your specialist and on to your doctorate. That's what you want when you talk about, you know, solidifying your pathway. So, so make those connections and, and get involved. Um, but, but get out there and seek out those opportunities for hands-on experience. Yeah, I would echo that. A lot of times I think transfer students are under the misconception that they are not able to engage with the university in the same way that a freshman applicant can or a freshman student can. Yes, timeline Timeline wise, four years is more than two years or three years, whatever it is you're going to transfer as. Um, we can't bend time. So yes, that is still true. But you can still very much engage with the university. And what we tend to see a lot is students don't realize that the first year, and then they cram everything in the last year, which is great. They get great experiences, but it makes for a stressful senior year. Um, I will say I did that many years ago when I was actually a transfer student at College Park, would not recommend. Uh, and you really want to get everything out of your college experience. There is so much to it beyond the classroom work. If it was just the classroom work, 
that can really be done anywhere. It's the fact that you're having these contacts of people that are top in the field that are doing research in things that you want to do research in, that you want to do career work in, that you're meeting people from all over, even in a virtual situation, you're still meeting people from all over. We have lots of virtual engagement because we are aware COVID is a thing. Like we can't make it go away. This is what we are living with. And since none of us want our students not to miss out on all those opportunities, we have moved them into a virtual space. Now you're not going to have a study abroad virtual program, obviously, but for most things, we have found a way to provide that engagement. But in the college level, the expectation is you are going to go look for it. No one's gonna come knock on your door and ask you if you would like to be part of their research project. So yes, make thank sure you. you take advantage of that. Yes, Mr. Harrod, your final thoughts because we have like maybe one minute left. <laughs> Yeah, and pretty much I was going to echo everything that's been said. Just, just, just get involved. Just jump in and do it. Um, you know, that's how you learn. I mean, I, even in my experiences, you know, some of my best friends and are are people that we just sat in class together and just started talking, and my business partner and all this that we would just sit on the bus on the tour and. We just started talking and that became my you no know, you know my business partner my best friend i'm the guy kid i mean the godfather of his kids and you know all that stuff and so it's more than just the sitting in the classroom experience it is the all the other things even if you have opportunities to participate in sporting events or greek life or you know all those things tie you into the university so take it take full advantage of it um you're paying for it so take full advantage of it so yeah that that would be my closing remarks on that well, thank you all very much. On behalf of the OITE, the Career uh, Day events, we really want to thank our Community College Day panel, uh, Ms. Reed, Dr. Kessie, Mr. Harad, and the entire OITE Community College Day team. Thank you all very much. And the participants, thank you all very, very much uh, for your interaction and engagement and take advantage of all of our uh, NIH OITE events, please visit our website. And even this session, along with all of the others today, will be available to you. Thank you all and have a happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Take great care. Goodbye. And kudos to our panelists. Goodbye.